joining in. We're going to get started in just a minute here. We're so excited to have Seema Alexander as our present as our presenter for today. So hello everyone. Welcome again to day four of DC Startup Week. We're coming to you live from WeWork here in downtown Washington, DC. I'm Rachel Kretzky. I am one of the organizers of DC Startup Week as well as a founder of a tech startup, UPACE. I'm so grateful that we're having throughout these five days around 4,000 attendees, over 100 events, over 200 speakers. And one of the main reasons we're able to do this is because of our wonderful sponsors. Just to highlight our title sponsors of the week that allow this week to be completely free is Next, powered by Shulman Rogers, Insperity, Wiz, as well as Technology Rivers. So a huge thank you to them. I'm so excited today to have Seema as our speaker today, talking through the tipping point and making pivots to your company, especially during these times of COVID-19. Seema last year was a panelist on two of the talks at DC Startup Week and got roped into the DC Startup Week community. And this year, she's also curating the Grow Track, helping founders think through how do you scale and how do you grow. Um, Seema has been a great resource for me, for my company, UPACE, so working with UPACE about how do I pivot during these times of COVID to make sure that we're able to continue our growth and how do we kind of look at things a little bit differently. So I can vouch for all of our insights as well as advice. So with that, please join me in welcoming Seema Alexander to the DC Startup Week stage. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm uh, honored, honestly privileged to be part of the DC startup community and really, really help curate some amazing panels this year. Um, I am just going to pull up my screen. Give me one second. Thank you all for joining today. I am, um, I've been, it's been interesting. Oops. It's been interesting the last couple of weeks I've produced two pretty large events and really was trying to think about how I wanted to uh, create this workshop for each of you today. Um, I do a lot of work with scale uh, and growth with visionary founders. And uh, in particular, what I have found is when you're looking to grow, there comes a specifically a tipping point where you've been working on your business for a while. You have a lot of learnings, right? But there's this whole concept of like, hey, you know, you got to work on your business, not in your business. You'll hear every guru say that, you know, you need to get back out and do strategic work. But what I always find is the gap is like, what is it that you want me to focus on? Because there's so many things as founders, as visionaries, as growth stage entrepreneurs that you have to focus on, right? So even when you do step away, it's really good to get guidance. So I actually created this presentation more as a working session. I'm going to make you work, guys. And so I would really advise if you could get out a notebook and a pen uh, or a paper, a piece of paper and a pencil, um, because I want you to really answer some hard questions during our, our conversation today. And they're hard in a sense that you're going to make some decisions and those decisions are going to help you with your path forward. So I'm going to start off with asking you to close your eyes. I know most of you guys are on, not on video, but I'm going to trust you do this. It's a really nice uh, process here. So I'm going to start. Imagine a time when you wake up in the morning and you feel completely aligned to your brand and business. It represents your core values. It represents your why. It provides you motivation and drive to want to tackle the next opportunity, next partnership, next sale, over and over again. Your product offering gets raving reviews and you are providing the transformation and the impact they were meant to provide. Your marketing and sales funnels are cohesive, working together, and are targeting your ideal client over and over again. Your customers are basically selling for you. You're truly living in the moment of what a lot of people call the entrepreneurial dream. Now, let me tell you something, you know, that is the goal, right? But uh, to get there is truly a journey. So anybody that tells you that the stuff happens overnight, you know, this takes 10 years longer sometimes or shorter for some, right? But it is truly a journey. There are lots of learnings in the process. So one of the things that I wanted to share with you is my favorite entrepreneurial quote to start us off. Entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people won't so that you, that you can spend the rest of your life like most people can't. Think about that. 
especially as you guys are going down your path to really transform an industry, create a service that is filling a gap. You know, all this stuff takes time in terms of building brand authority, learning through the processes, creating pricing that works, you know, creating sales teams, all of that. But it, it, it is worth it in every capacity. So if you're here with me today, I'm I'm in the assumption that one of these things are happening in your business. And if there's anything in addition, I would really appreciate if you guys can use a chat function. I'm going to be polling uh, and providing some questions a little later, but be active. I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can throughout as well. So your business is either evolved in a sense like, okay, we're going to, you've been in business for a while and who you are publicly is not really who you are now internally because those changes have not been reflected in your brand. You're just working on too many things. Um, you might be here because you have too many focuses, right? We all have this uh, shiny object syndrome, but also a lot of people just have a lot of product out or a lot of service offerings. So there are too many focuses that bifurcate your brand. Your message may be too broad and it's not speaking ideally to your, uh, to your or directly to your ideal client. You know, you might be lacking growth. You may have this concept called website shame and are gonna get into that as some real stuff there. Uh, you may have non-existent sales funnel, inconsistent marketing. You know, what all, all of this stuff is real and it happens to all of us. And it's important that you're here today because we're gonna talk through a lot of how to reconcile a lot of these things. So in this session, we're gonna review a few things. I have a concept called repositioning the scale. I'm gonna tell you what that is. I do not come from an agency background. So I, I'm gonna, this is not um, brand lingo in the way that is brand lingo. I'm a strategist at heart and I have a branding specialty or repositioning strat, uh, specialty. So I'll share what that means in a few minutes. We're gonna talk about five business drivers that will be critical to address before you reposition your brand to scale. Uh, we're going to dig into some hard questions where you're going to be doing some work. And then I'm going to share some examples. It's always good to put this stuff in practice and see what others are doing. Um, one thing I'll share is this is not going to be a generic talk. Like, I, like I've worked with too many people for this to be fluff, right? Um, there, are, there are questions that I think need to be answered. And I work with any founder. Um, these are some of the foundational things that we go through so that they can get clearer on their path forward. I've had a lot of experience in general for, you know, hearing, you know, what founders struggle with, how businesses fail, how they succeed, you know, what are the strategies? So I want to really start to hone in on that with you. So what is this concept? Repositioning to scale, right? And I, you know, the original word reposition is to put in a new or different position. It's a shift. It's a pivot, right? It's all of that. And I think that's always a core buzzword these days, right? But for me, reposition to scale means more of a, you're creating a brand positioning to change the, uh, to really build clarity around your brand and what your company stands for. And specifically with your ideal client in mind. And this is not just a logo tagline strategy. It's actually far from it. This is what will drive your strategy and your growth going forward. Um, what we're going to talk about are what like the fundamental pieces of what I would like you to really hone in on now that you've learned. Again, this goes back to if you're just starting out, this is going to be good fundamental questions to just ask from the beginning. But there are many of you on this, especially in the growth track that have had a lot of experience doing what you're doing right now. Um, and things have evolved. So we're going to get clear on who you serve, what you offer them, how you offer it. Why do you do what you do? So important and so critical. And uh, how you compare to other competitors around, right? I only ask one thing. I really need you to commit to doing this work. If you do answer these questions, and I'm happy to provide this presentation after the fact, but I'd like you to take the time today and, and start to noodle down some of these answers that I'm gonna go through. You know, because business is always, always moments of truth. Um, in a lot of my uh, presentations, I share this. I share this chart. There's an evolution of an entrepreneur, right? The first year we learn, the second year we probably pivot, by the third year we're gaining some traction. And this between three and five year, there's always this concept of repositioning. You know, I'm, I, this is who I was, but because I learned from, because of my customers or the feedback on the product, or, you know, I, I don't see how I'm differentiating myself. There's a lot of this concept of what I call is repositioning. And over time you grow and then there's next steps and what you want to do next. 
But the truth of the matter is there's so much more to this story, right? Because as you're growing your company, life happens, COVID happens, big sales deals that you thought you were going to get don't always happen. And then there's also these amazing moments that do, right? So your trajectory would be very different than somebody else. And I need you to own that for a second, right? Everybody's story, everybody's business is different. There's some fundamental, you know, strategies that I will share with you, but it's important that you understand you're owning your own journey here. So um, I'm going to start to share the repositioning evolution. And I want you to take accountability and be honest with yourself, you know, in, in your space um, about some of these core things that I'm gonna ask you. Um, the reason I keep saying that is I've worked with a lot of visionary CEOs and these are people that want to disrupt the market and I love it. Like I, I, I'm such a, I get attracted to people that see a big problem and a gap and uh, that they want to solve. And for me, it's like, okay, how do we build your authority? And then how do we build a company and a, a business model that really starts to penetrate into that marketplace? But then there's also a level of where I've worked with um, some visionaries that like, they have high levels of eco, right? And, and some can be previous CEOs of companies to whatever, they've had successes in the past, but your success in the past does not equal what happens today in your future, right? And so you can build off of that momentum 100%, but there's some fundamental things that no matter who you are, you need to really focus on to get clear in your path forward. So as I mentioned before, this exercise is not about logo, it's about strategy, okay? So if you guys don't know me, I know Rachel gave you a quick overview. Um, my name is Seema Alexander. I'm the founder and chief strategy officer of disruptive.ceo. Uh, it's a strategic advisory and coaching firm. And I work with visionary entrepreneurs to help maximize their, uh, their growth uh, and, and sales and impact and profits. Okay. And a lot of times I do that in two ways, help build their personal brands, their CEO brands and build out authority. And second, I really work on this repositioning and I've worked with smaller companies to, you know, in the next uh, month, I'm going to be working with a company that's at $50 million in sales and they're just going through a rebrand. So this concept really does work for uh, a lot of people. Uh, so my story uh, in a quick snapshot, it's always important, I think, to share why I care. Um, I have entrepreneurial roots. My parents came from India with literally nothing. Um, started the first Indian vegetarian restaurant in Washington, D.C. And like, you know, we had like Muhammad Ali there. My dad was like a pillar in the vegetarian society, if you will. And but over a 20 year time span, it went from doing really well to close to bankruptcy. And, you know, we did the site would put a notice of foreclosure on here because that was the cause I was getting when I was 15 years old at my house. And me realizing when things go well in a business, you know, the CEO and just around them, people are thriving. Uh, but when they're not, lots falls apart. And for many of us, our business is our identity right? It's who we are. And if things are not doing well, you know, you're eating a little bit more, your relationship may not be doing well, you're getting pissed off at your kids, you know, these are real things that happen. So I did at a young age, I studied really hard of just understanding why businesses fail and why they succeed. But then I ran away from everything entrepreneurship. I wanted uh, to be a Fortune 500 uh, CMO. Um, I went to New York. I was a, I would call myself a little bit of a corporate warrior. I was at Prudential Financial for about 13 years, um, focused on business strategy and growth. But the one thing I wanted to mention here, I worked on the historical rebrand of Prudential Financial. So in the market, the company perception was very much like an insurance company and an old stodgy company. And I had a very critical moment in my career where I realized when you create a rebrand, Okay, or repositioning of a company. Again, it goes back to it's not a logo. It's the promise that you want to deliver, but then how do you operationalize that in your marketing and sales and, and customer service and all the various pieces in your business to truly deliver on something that a customer is going to care about and provide raving reviews for you. So it was a very critical time in my career. I ended up uh, six years ago, this picture is funny, I'm looking down, but I am in a hospital bed um, and I'm looking down because I'm answering emails because that was my mentality at that time. Not that I'm not a very, I, I work hard, promise, but in, in terms of corporate, I had a pulmonary embolism in between both of my children and I had what I call a midlife awakening, probably like a lot of you have recently as COVID has hit, right? It gives you a moment to pause and reset. 
I ended up leaving and I have been in the growth startup space since, worked in two startups and then started my own agency and have served over 250 founders and visionaries. I worked as in residence in some of my companies as a CMO, um, but really, really, uh, I, I, no regrets, so happy to be aligned to my purpose. Um, so how does, let's just get into this, right? So how does a repositioning exercise affect your business model? Um, so, you know, this, what I'm going to walk you through is this is an opportunity for you to get much more confident in what you're able to deliver on your brand promise. You're going to get clarity for internal, for if it's yourself, if you have employees, people want to know what you stand for. Like, where are we headed, right? Who is our ideal client now, really? We've been kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall for so long. We got to get focused, you know. Our sales material has to come together. Our marketing funnels have to work together. I'm sure, you know, if you're in growth mode, you've heard all of that. Right. Um, you know, I, I won't read these all, but these are some of the key things. You know, obviously, additional revenue, attracting and in, attracting investment dollars. You know, I have stories of you know folks who are looking for funding, but their external perception doesn't really look like what they're actually doing. So a lot of investors will pass because they don't know what's really going on behind the curtain, and that's a really important miss. And things that we're going to talk about. So the five critical business drivers that I'm going to address today, um, this is pre, what I call PS, uh, PS, pre-scale, right? It's pre-scale. So um, brand alignment and public perception, ideal client, identification and validation, um, a validated, transformative, and unique product offering, um, moving, this is going to be a big one, I can't wait to talk about this, but moving from a generalist and becoming a specialist, and reconciling your vision, why, and strategy. Now, this is where I really would like you guys to take out your pencils and pens and your notebooks or journals, whatever you do, because I'm gonna start asking some tough questions. Um, and I really, really would like you guys to participate in this. Um, so if you could, in the chat, let's start there. Could you share with me on a scale from one to 10, how aligned do you feel with the way your company's public brand persona is represented today? So one being not aligned at all, and then 10 being completely aligned. So basically what I'm asking you is, does your personal brand, I mean, your public uh, business brand truly, truly uh, embrace who you guys are? And do you feel aligned to it? I'm seeing a total mix. Some sixes, some sevens, some threes, okay. I'm gonna share, it's funny. Um, there's a company that I worked with for a while. It's called Medici. Just, I'm going to um, sprinkle in some examples on why I ask these questions. I think it's important. So Medici used to be uh, actually a company called Let's Talk Payments. Let's Talk Payments was the number one fintech blog five years ago or six years ago. It, it was the first one around. It had a million hits every year uh, and it was growing, you know, and over time, the founders uh, evolved and they, they were working on much more global advisory for much more than just the payment sector. So I remember speaking to the CEO and, and you know, their initial website, it was imagined, it was just like, it wasn't visually appealing per se. It was doing well in terms of hits, but it just wasn't visually appealing. So he had, he would have multiple conversations with investors, but didn't want to take out his, his phone, right? And show them what was behind the scenes or actually what was in, in the public persona and he's like that hindered me for so long because i didn't feel aligned until i started working through this rebrand and we worked through it together so it's just it shows you how important that alignment is and if you haven't done that um how does it um it's important to start thinking about these questions so in your perspective right and i don't know if you guys have feedback or whatever it looks like how do you think the public perceives your brand um like in terms of like do you believe that there's disconnect between what the public sees and, and again, what your current customers, prospects, potential investors, what's actually happening in your business? Just think about that for a second. And some of these are pretty quick. You can either say yes or no for yourself, right? And I'm just throwing these things out there because it's, uh, these are potential gaps that need to be filled. And for some of you, they may not be, right? And so everyone, again, I think between the five drivers, there will be, um, definitely some questions that you guys are going to work on or need to work on sort of the nature of the beast because it's funny you know even in a few years you'll evolve again right so i this is the do to work um do the work um i'm 
again, I'm going to provide you guys these slides and this is, you don't have to do this right now. Um, but I would really, uh, this is such an important exercise when you do a brand audit, right? What external assets need to be updated? This includes your, from your LinkedIn to your website to anything that you have that may include reviews or whatever that looks like. You know, you, you really wanna take the time to look at what your brand audit, okay? And then the second thing that I think is very important is um, when we did our major exercise at Prudential, and I do a lot of exercises for my clients, I asked them, especially if they're in growth mode, we need to collect the proof points, the case studies, the stories, right? Things that we can actually hear from other people talking about your brand. And there's always a pause because some people just find it very difficult to ask for testimonials or, um, you know, and, and I think it's such an important thing when other people hear about your brand and your business from someone else and they're raving about it, it just makes all the difference. So these are things I want you to start to just um, do on your own. Look at that brand audit, look at the things that you need to update. Again, after we go through this whole process, you'll start to think about well, how do you wanna position it, right? I think there's some work to be done there, but collecting these proof points as part of your strategy going forward, I think is very critical. So the second question I have for you is ideal client identification and validation. Now this is <laughs> by far one of the biggest misses that I uh, see when, when businesses are in growth mode, because I think I mentioned this before, right? When you're in the beginning stages, you're throwing spaghetti at the wall. You need revenue in the door, right? If you're in government contracting and you're subbing and you're just like, well, okay, what is it a vehicle that I can win? If you're selling, you know, um, services, you know, what's the low hanging fruit? But sometimes, you know, these clients, and please answer this in the chat. Do you honestly know your ideal client? who it is, right? Um, because sometimes it's really hard to figure this out. It's so fundamental um, and so important and critical because as we get into um, the messaging piece of this, the goal is that you're speaking to that ideal client, right? And, I, and that, that is, you want to really be able to show that you know them in a way that, you know, almost better than they know themselves. Because the goal is that your product or service is literally the thing that um, is solving their biggest pain point, right? These are all not new concepts, but, but I, I can't tell you enough how hard this is for founders to get clear because a lot of times they're working on five different verticals at the same time and you're out there and you're lean if you're not in scale mode and you don't have a lot of employees it's really hard to go after everybody when you're going after everybody you're speaking to nobody right really really important for that right so if one of your targets is you know gyms for example let's get really clear on the way that you're speaking to them so Yes and no, I'm seeing, um, I have a good idea, but could always use uh, feedback. Yes, but it could narrow it. Okay, and we're gonna talk about narrowing it and that concept and what that has done for companies, especially ones who really learn their market, right? Um, when you're first starting out, guys, you know, you're, you are gonna throw spaghetti against the wall. I mean, the goal is that you've created a product or solution that truly is transformational and it has a pain point that it solves for and it's an essential pain point, but we'll, we'll get to that for a second. So take a minute, I'm gonna give you a minute, literally. I want you guys to think about who is, like if you haven't had this exercise in a while, write them down, like who is your ideal client? Like who is it that you're going after and you're like, if I won this person or if they bought my product or solution, you know, not only would I like be happy, but the, our product is, it's gonna kill it for them. Like they're, we're gonna give them what we promised, right? So do me a favor, write that down. And I think that next question is the most critical. Who is not your client, right? And a lot of people don't answer that, right? And it's interesting because there are many companies that I work with that, that say, you know what, I have this legacy client or multiple legacy clients here and we got them early on or, you know, but they're draining me. They're draining my resources. They're always asking for custom features. They're really, really like not my ideal client. Now I figured it out. I'm gonna go after this industry. My feature sets are working around that or whatever, if you're tech or not, your solution set, you know, but how do we learn to fire the clients that are not ideal for us, right? Because that's also a strategy in growth, right? You cannot have your resources sucked away, especially being lean, 
uh, you know, buy a few core accounts because sometimes you have to take two steps backwards to go forwards. It's really an important key thing for you to think about. And um, the other thing just for, uh, for this particular part of it is what has changed? I, you know, I think Rachel mentioned, I've done a lot of pivot strategy and just conversations and workshops around this, but your avatar of just six months ago is different now. It, you know, that he or she, or, you know, whoever it may be, they have different priorities, you know, things have shifted in them with life, right? So how, like, w think about what extra challenges and opportunities do you have to work with them? Are there ways to make your product essential in their eyes with some shifts? You know, you really, really need to really think through, you know, what has changed, right? Because I'm sure some of you um, may be seeing tremendous growth right now, depending on the industry that you're in, because our world has changed. And I've seen a lot of um, founders, there are a couple specifically that I'm working with that their product makes so much more sense in this environment. They needed people to feel the pain and so that they can provide them support and security. But then there are many others, right? Many others that are, are struggling, right? My, my mom, uh, did they own a dry cleaner, okay? Like, like zips, <laughs> like, you know, they were the dry cleaner. They were doing well for years. Where do you think they are right now with everything closed, right? And you know, we're thinking about it. Like, how can we reposition this dry cleaner to really, you know, be of value? And just to add to that, you know, and I'll just give you a strategy, you know, for me, it's like, okay, get involved with the local commerce in your area, find out what businesses and what offices are actually opening or, or are open, just target them. There's no reason to target the masses anymore. So these little shifts are so critical, especially now when, you know, we have limited sort of reach, uh, depending again, what industry and what business you're part of. Okay, um, so this is do the work. This is do it at home. Again, I will provide the slides. You know, it's so important to truly know not only your ideal client, but the avatar. And, uh, and if it's lingo that you guys are not accustomed to, this is, hey, my avatar is Seema Alexander. I'm 42 years, she's 42 years old. She's a mom of two kids. You know, she does X, Y, and Z. Her biggest frustrations are this, you know. These are some, you know, newer questions that I think are really important for you to look at and answer. Because the goal is obviously you're thinking about it in a sense of what you offer, right? And, and how in the scale of what, you know, Seema Alexander needs, how essential is your product to what is going on in her life today? You gotta outline those pain points. You gotta really, and it goes back to, these are critical points of getting your messaging and getting your strategies correct and aligned uh, going forward. Um, one other thing I really want to address is make sure you understand what your total addressable market is. And so that is just a, another piece that I feel like a lot of founders miss is like, um, sometimes they get super niched, right? And then they're like, all right, we're gonna go after this. And it's a very limited amount of people that really fall into that category. So, you know, there is a balance there. Um, uh, like until I, like if there are questions on that, we can get into it, but it is important just to, you know, do some research. What's the total addressable market? Very important. All right, the third driver here, and this is another poll, and I'm gonna keep looking. I know you guys are all participating. Thank you so much for participating. Um, do you have a validated product offering? Emphasis on validated, yes or no, okay? This is critical, validated. <laughs> I, and I'm not laughing to laugh, I'm laughing because, uh, I'm not even laughing. It's a, it's such a critical part in everybody's business. And when you do, and I see lots of yeses, which is really exciting to me. And then I see a not yet, and that's okay. But validation cannot mean that I've sold a couple of them. Uh, my friends and family love it. You know, they, they think it's like, I want to see repeatable, repeatable, repeatable business. As you as the founder, you should be able to actually do the whole sales pitch with your ideal client in mind. And so before you ever hire salespeople or any of that, like that is a, such an important cycle for you to go through from awareness to conversion and then retention, right? So there's, let me, the questions that I wanna ask you here, I love the yeses here, it makes me excited. I can't wait, I wish I could hear more about what you guys are up to. Um, so my question is, how do you know your product is validated? Do you have the data 
the proof, the anecdotal proof, like, you know, and, and you just make sure that you guys are continuously looking at the data and getting feedback, either through customer feedback, through surveys, through outreaches, multiple ways of getting feedback on this stuff. And just looking at, you know, I, if you're a product-based offering, are they coming back? Are there repeatable sales, right? Like those are all things that you need to look at from a, a metrics perspective. The other thing that I want you to challenge, a challenge question is, have you bifurcated your brand? Or do you have too many offerings out in the marketplace, right? And what does that do? I have, <laughs> I have a multiple businesses in mind, but one in particular, and it's you, what you do is you lose trust in the marketplace when you get really excited and you're like, I'm going to launch this, I'm going to launch this, you know, and it may make sense. But what happens is when, when you go out and you pitch one thing, and then three months later, two, two weeks later for some people, it becomes, oh, and, and we're also doing this and we're also doing this. You know, what my real suggestion is go out, obviously with the validated product, go get a lot of traction, get your reviews, your testimonials, your social proof, and then move to the next, uh, if, if that's the strategy, right? I don't know the strategy. Again, we, that is just really important that you don't get too caught up and, uh, trying to create too much and then people are confused of who you are and so what happens and just to give you a, a clue here when they do that when they're confused they start naming you as this person and if you have evolved or if you are working on something else you're only going to be in that box so it's really important to figure out what box you want to be known for um, transformation what is pain points is your product solving for your ideal client so there there is this concept of like does your product get your prospect from their pain point here and truly close it out on this side? And how big is that gap? How important is that gap to them? How essential is that gap to them? You know, that's something, the concept of transformational product uh, and unique at that. Um, going into that last question around current competitors and what makes you different and your sweet spot. These are again, very strategic questions. Um, sounds like a lot of you have a validated product, which I am super excited about. Uh, look forward to, I'd love to see actually, if you wanna put your websites in the chat, I'd love to see um, some of your businesses. It's always intriguing for me to see different business models and what's working and what's not. So happy to um, review anything you guys put in the chat. So this is the work. Um, how do you know, again, it goes back to how do you know your product is validated and what's the data, right? And you can look at through the questions here. Um, some things that you may wanna think about, well, if someone's always asking me for custom features, then, then maybe you haven't hit the baseline product that's actually validated, right? Or if someone's asking for discounts and are not willing to pay the full price, maybe you haven't figured out that your product is validated. Those are other nuances that you need to think through. You might be selling through, but there are things that might be tweaks that you can make in your strategy to make it even stronger and more compelling. Thank you guys for sharing. Looking forward to seeing a lot of these websites. Um, is your product still essential during COVID? And I, we already talked about that, right? How do you think about positioning it where now you're, um, if you were non-essential, how do we become essential again? So things for you to think about um, at home um, or you know, later on today uh, around this stuff, really important stuff. So the fourth strategy, and I cannot tell you how critical, how critical this is, um, if you're ready. Right, this is really hard for some people who are generalists um, to move to becoming a specialist. So over time, um, like I said, a lot of people go out and they're really afraid to niche. And please let me know, are you afraid to niche down? Do you believe you're gonna lose revenue and customers? I'm gonna give you a couple examples and I think I missed probably a couple examples earlier, but I'll come back to them. So Melina Mulcani, okay, she's like a influencer type um, in terms of persona. She's a registered dietitian. Uh, a couple years ago, she had come to me and she's a, you know, she's a well-known registered nutritionist. She was an ambassador, ambassador for American Dietitian Society, um, but we helped her niche into what she really is, which is really focused on picky eating with children and specifically baby weaning, like baby weaning. Now over this repositioning, instead of just being somebody who helps with weight loss, she has now built a incredible following, built a tremendous products specifically, has a book specific to it. Her thought leadership has expanded tremendously. She's asked to speak everywhere. Her business is doing super well. So she niched down. 
right? And it was a process, it was not easy. It was not easy, but it was a process that's working really well. Remarkably, so this is a, it's a really interesting story. Um, they used to be VMO Partners, which is a marketing agency focused on multifamily real estate. They learned a lots of lessons with, you know, if they were to tweak certain things within the marketing strategy, within Facebook ads, within all this stuff, they knew how to reduce the time frame of leasing for these newer multifamily rentals that came out. And so they actually uh, repositioned themselves as a company called Remarkably, and it's a tech now, tech focused and very, and when they were in VMO, I forgot to mention, they were in like five different industries. And when they decided to niche down in real estate, they, they went, their growth went 10X because now they were known for that, right? And then they built off this tech um, spinoff, which is doing really, really well for them. You know, again, it took time, but they're in that process. So really, really interesting when you see growth as you move from a generalist to a specialist. Um, here are just a couple things for you to think about. Identify those top three target markets um, that you want to be known as a unique solution for and what you can truly deliver on. And then identifying the top industry that you know truly that you could serve with your eyes closed, right? Because those are the like the wins, right? Those are the things that it becomes so much easier as you start thinking about your marketing, as you start thinking about your sales strategy, your sales funnel, right? When you really know, okay, I'm going to just target these guys. They're in this industry. This is how I go after them. You know, it's just, it becomes a lot easier over time. Um, and you know, this is the work that you can do at home. Um, if you have a niche, you, I, I, I will encourage you to ask yourself why, because sometimes there's this level of being afraid, um, even though you know that you could kill it in an industry, like you have all the relationships or you're very good at it or your sales have always been strong in that industry, but you're looking um, for specific things that um, you may be thinking, I'm gonna lose out on these types of revenue. So again, every business is different. I'm not going to um, generalize, but I am gonna say, I really would like you to take a look and, and think about it much more strategically. You may take two steps back to take 10 steps forward, right? Because all of a sudden you're not focused on those other streams, but you get much more focused as a team and, and you know, with your efforts, it, it does change the game. So you can take a look at these others. I'm just in the, for time purposes, I'm gonna keep going. Um, the fifth and the last one in terms of drivers is reconciling your vision, why, and strategy. So I just wanna know for when, when you guys first started your business, does your vision, and your why, is it still there, right? Is it still hold true with what you've evolved to today, right? Because it needs to translate into strategy. There's a lot of learnings that happen. Um, so let me know, yes or no, if you think your why and your vision is held through throughout. Um, uh, and my question to you is, are you still aligned to your mission? Like, have you evolved as a person? You know, I know folks who have started businesses for several years and realize that this is actually not who they are. And when there's misalignment in how you represent your brand or your product offerings, you know, I, I, I bet you there's a lot less conversations about it. You may be doing what's needed, but you're not vocally talking about and screaming about your business all the time. You know, as a founder and CEO, you are your number one salesperson. You need to be blasting that out. So if there is something that's in you that's misaligned, that's something that needs to be addressed sooner than later, right? And what does that look like as a next step? So um, I would ask you again to review your vision, mission, and why, and you know, really have that conversation with yourself is how do I need to tweak anything uh, within my core here so that this is much more aligned to who I am, who I've become, where the business is going, how this all feels. It's really important, especially as you're in growth mode. So um, again, going back to that framework, once you have like, you know, you've identified, you've really uh, looked at your ideal client, you've validated your product offering, you've, you've focused on, you know, looking at it from a concept of, can I move from being a generalist to a specialist? Like, you know, all those things are so important as you start looking at how do I reposition myself so that we are truly unique in the marketplace and in the industry that we serve, um, that we hold true to what we offer and our, pro our, our brand promises there, we're clear on how we offer it. So I'm gonna show you some examples, okay? Because I think it's always so helpful when um, 
Well, we can look at examples. So um, I'm going to start with just some gen general ones, right? When talking about initial positioning and, and how that shifted over time, but how it's impacted their business, right? So I'm sure most of you are familiar with a leave the, you know, initially it was, it's a painkiller, right? Um, you only need it. It's out of convenience. Like, you know, it's the first one that says you only need to take it one, one pill every 12 hours, right? Which is the initial positioning. And then over years, like they realized that they were just competing with Tylenol and Advil and you know, trying to figure out how to differentiate themselves. And they decided to go from generalist to specialist and focus on relieving arthritis pain. They have grown substantially because of it and obviously set themselves apart from their competitors, right? Um, Apple Watch also, ooh, Apple Watch also was an interesting, when they first came out, they wanted to be a fashion brand, you know, they're like, oh, we have different wands and like da, 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 and it didn't resonate first generation, right? And then they realized from feedback that people were using it as this functional device to track their health and wellness. And they, they learned, right? They evolved. And then they started positioning themselves as that company. Yeah, this is right. You know, this, this watch is really, it is functional in that way. Yes, it's going to be nice and beautiful and designed well. It is Apple, of course. But they reframed it as a, you know, a health and wellness functional uh, device. And as you all know, it's been doing tremendously well. I don't even know what generation they're on right now. Um, these are other examples that I've worked on personally. It's just a few. I have multiple others. Um, just from a prudential perspective, I mean, we worked on the entire strategy and it was, again, very compelling to do. But we all like specifically, I'll share it with like the group retirement business, which was um, in the billions of dollars of assets under management. You know, they had the group insurance, a group um, retirement plans, 401ks, all that stuff, right? But they also look like we're starting to gain a lot of traction in this concept of pension risk transfer, both in the United States and internationally. And they decided to lead with that. Um, and that there's this concept that I talk about, which I can't share at all today. There's a lot already in here. Uh, uh, when you start leading with one, when people start to recognize who you are, you know, you get much more uh, traction, more thought leadership in the industry. Uh, referrals start to come in. Uh, you get to really hone in on the content, the marketing and the sales, right? So that's really what occurred at Peru. Um, I'll quickly mention, you know, Simply Cheeky is just another one. They're a um, baby, um, cot organic cotton baby brand. And um, when I started with Gwen years ago, years ago, um, she was interesting. She would kind of talk about, I create clothes that make people happy. And literally they're like onesies for kids with really cute, like little sayings, very, um, uh, what's the word, um, when you're Marina, like, you know, for, for Anyway, you could take a look at her website, but she was going after, you know, like the moms. And if you're, um, I'm a mom of two and like with white onesies, like, you know, you don't, it's a really, it's not something that you actually purchase um, because, you know, it'll get dirty really quick. One poop, one pee, one this, right? One piece of food and that's gone in a lot of ways. So we helped her reposition and think about her ideal client is actually not the mom. It's the best auntie, the one who hasn't had kids yet, who wants to be have like this amazing gift at the, at the baby shower, but that's helped her grow substantially, you know? So it's these little tweaks, the real little tweaks that matter strategically. One of the um, last uh, case study I wanted to show was uh, uh, Yellowtail, and I'm going to disclaimer, he is not a client of mine, but uh, a good friend and peer. And I found, you know, we leveraging this framework and showing you guys was really useful. So um, this is Juby Viscaris. Uh, he was actually on a panel uh, yesterday on or two days ago on digital marketing that was moderating. So um, he has a company called Yellowtail and Yellowtail is an IT company that was based out of Silver Spring, Maryland. It was brick and mortar pre COVID um, doing really well. And their concept was uh, they serve non-technical folks um, who want IT careers. And initially he actually just said, you know, they're non-technical folks, right. Who, who are thinking about like getting into IT and, and through this process, he actually made a tweak. And each one of these, he's made a tweak. He said, no, it's actually the non-technical folks who are ready to make the transition into an IT career. They're already looking, right? So it's one is to think about, it's another thing to look. Really small nuance, super important in terms of attraction, in terms of your message and your marketing. 
Um, what they offer is this nine month Linksys training program. Okay, and then what it does, it certifies you for a Linksys uh, trainer or Linksys certified, if you will. How they offer it previous to COVID, they actually did everything in person. Post COVID, they were at everything online. So he reduced his operations substantially because there was no more brick and mortar. I think he's still working through leases and stuff, but that's, that's the end goal. Um, and then what do you, like what you do, uh, what he did, you know, in terms of like uh, the alignment there, he realized that this was a way, um, it helps people provide them a path to freedom. And that was very much aligned to who he is, his value system, uh, and what happened to him as he got uh, better and better into entrepreneurship. And then the last thing there is, you know, what makes him different? And this was critical is what makes him so unique is after you go through this nine months. So look, this is a nine month program. It's not cheap, right? You go through it. Now it's all online, but guess what? We have job placement after, and we can basically guarantee you a job as close to six figures because he has all those partnerships in place. So think how strong that whole, this framework can be when you get clear on that. Right. And so as you're looking to reposition a scale, this strategy now, he has taken this, he has created a strong sales funnel online. He has 10 X growth in just a few months. Um, I find this case study fascinating. And, you know, this is things that I want to share with you because once you get clear on these things, things start to come together. Right. Um, I, you know, I've worked in environments where, the product wasn't validated, right? And this is a funded company and they brought in a head of sales and he had to go out and sell, you know, these large consulting deals, but he really didn't even believe in the product because the, he knew that the company couldn't deliver on it. That's a problem, right? We haven't talked about employees and, and truly the sales cycle and marketing and the true funnels. Like, you know, again, like I said, there's a lot here, right? But these are the fundamentals. These are things I see all the time. These five key drivers to help you reposition. Because the truth is, where you started is not where you are right now. Okay, if you're in growth mode or if you're, you've been in business a few years. So let's reconcile both of them. Go through the learnings that you've had. Make some hard decisions so that you can really focus on your strategy going forward for growth and scale. So um, I call this the tipping point presentation. Uh, the tipping point in terms of definition is the critical point in a situation, process, or system beyond which a significant and often unstoppable effect or change takes place. So what's your tipping point? You know, like think about what I shared. Some of you seem like you're completely on the same path or the right path. Some of you, I'm sure, have some you know, work to do in some of these strategies, which is completely normal, right? But it's also exciting, right? If once you start to get clear, you can start to see how all these pieces start to come together. And then if, you know, you come back and say, you know what, Seema, my product is not validated. And I don't know if it could be. That's okay, because that's an opportunity to pivot. And, and knowing that now will save you so much time and hassle for years to come. <laughs> I can't, I mean, I think we all know that, right? But sometimes it's hard to do the work. And sometimes it's hard to admit it. Right. Um, but having, you know, having the opportunity to take time and, and really think through your business strategically, looking at this framework, do the work. Um, I promise you will be worth it. So if you guys want a copy of this presentation or a 30 minute consult with me, please feel free to email me at sema at disruptive.ceo. And it is not .com, it's .ceo. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn too at Seema Alexander or through Attendify. Um, I really uh, hope this uh, conversation was helpful. If there are any questions, I'm uh, open to answering right now. I don't know if I saw. Um, may we get a review copy of recording later? Yes, I, um, Samuel, we, uh, we are looking in terms of strategically for the DC Startup Week to figure out ways to uh, add um, some of this, um, some of all these uh, presentations on a, on a streaming platform of some sort. So stay tuned. Hello, Dana. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is a truly a challenger conversation. I, I really wanted this to be about, you know, you guys and, and thinking about, you know, some of the key things that most of us think about in our head. We don't always admit, 
um, but important to go through strategically if you're trying to grow. So thank you guys. I'm really open to having any questions. I'm open to like. Um, so if I don't see, thank you, thank you. Um, I do want, I'm gonna, and you know, if you guys want, you can always save the chat on with those three little buttons. I want to save it because I want to see all those amazing um, websites that you guys provided. Is there any guidance on marketing to federal agencies? Oh, that is a great question. You know, it's funny because I'm not a government contracting expert. I actually have a friend on here who is a contractor for the government and probably share a lot more than I can. Um, I'm doing work more in the repositioning strategy for some of the larger government agency contractors, but I have a great contact. Actually, um, when we do replay uh, these, these sessions, there's one um, I curated that was yesterday, which was phenomenal, all about growth and leveraging government partnerships and government agencies. Um, I would love for you to take a look at that. They, they were uh, Joyce Sandenberger. She has a go-to-market company specific for startups who are looking to target um, the federal agency market. Uh, and there was a couple founders on there that gave some fire information, like really good. So I hope that um, you will be able to stream that. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert there. So, um, Who is your target customer? What's the avatar for who you love working with? Great question. So my target uh, customer is truly a visionary founder. So I love people who are masters in their craft. Okay. So this is not like I'm starting from scratch. I have this idea. It's a, I've worked with, I've worked in this industry for a while. I see this major gap. I really need to build out my um, sort of my CEO authority in my, uh, in this particular space and also curate a business model or reposition my business model. So like if I'm ever doing one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's, I go in with my clients and it's a very specific few that I work with. If I'm working with companies, I do a lot more in this concept of repositioning, um, and training their leadership if they're in the process of repositioning and they need support on that or in the post where they're looking at how do I now take this and implement a strategy where we can effectively operate it within the business, uh, support telling my employees how it impacts them, my customers, really creating an overall strategy there. So those are, um, that's who my target customer is. Thanks, Brad, for asking. Yeah, but I like my goal, guys, is um, I true to, truth to be told, like I want to lead the repositioning of the DMV and, and truly becoming an entrepreneurial hub. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. I've met so many of you. I'm really excited to continue to um, network and, and meet a lot of you. But there's there, you know, we have a lot of work to do to get there in terms of investment dollars and, and attracting visionary leaders here. And, and um, I'm working on another end of a couple of projects to help support that, which hopefully will uh, support all of you as, as you're building. Okay, what second, what said, it was really good there. Um, uh, what's the difference between your reputation and your brand? I would imagine the two would become one, especially in the beginning. So I'm a big believer of personal brand, especially if you're a founder and CEO. There are a lot of founders that hide behind um, sort of their business brand. And like when people look you up, and there's no social proof that like, if, for, again, for me and my avatar, right? My avatar is the visionary sort of like the people that are trying to disrupt or they're just looking at a product or service differently, but you need to be that advocate. So I like, I, I think your personal brand and your business brand should be aligned in, in some capacity if you're trying to really um, disrupt a marketplace. So I hope that was helpful. I, like, I think reputation is everything. Like if you, like for me is if I ever hear from a client, like Seema, I, I can't, like I, that wasn't good. I, it would like kill me inside. <laughs> like, I, like I think, my, you know, being, doing what you do and this concept of a brand promise and delivering on your brand promise is so critical to scale, right? Like you want, you want people to be raving fans of you. Uh, what's the difference? We talked about that. DC on the map again. Do you work with pre-startups or day one startups? I, you know, I, like I'm looking at putting together more of an accelerator for pre-startups. I'm like, ha, ha, or do like VIP days type of thing. Um, happy, you know, like I, I've definitely done it. I've definitely done it. it you know, it comes down to, um, 
this stuff is really fun for me too, guys. It's like, I don't, like, I, I just like, when someone's really passionate about something, I like honing them in and getting them very clear early so that they can really, you know, accelerate. So um, conversation we have, I'm opening. Thank you, Jolie. Uh, I would like to know how long it will take to pivot within a company. What kinds of strategies would you recommend? So that's a, um, that's a hard question when I don't know what your company is about. Uh, let's see, I've had, you know, let's see, let me think about, you know, we talked a little bit about the dry cleaners and thinking about ways of pivoting their uh, target audience and really being able to speak to a new audience that's actually can leverage dry cleaning today. We talked about, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a, there's so many strategies, but I just don't know. So I think it's really looking at your product and service, figuring out if you're product is essential right now or non-essential. If it's non-essential, one of the core things I would ask is for you guys to start reaching out to your own customers and, and talking to them. Find out what their new pain points are today, right? So if there is some correlation between what you're working on and, and um, maybe there's something later on in your product cycle that makes sense today versus what, you know, three months from now, bring that up as an opportunity. I've seen a lot of companies do that as well. So I think you got to do the research and uh, happy to, um, well, you know, if you want to shoot me an email, maybe we can chat a little bit more on that. Any guidance on marketing? How are we doing on timing, Rach? I know it's almost 11. One minute. Okay. Well, maybe this quick last question. Any guidance on marketing and positioning across cultural boundaries internationally for service providing training? Um, you know, it, it, I think international, it all comes down to reputation and relationships. So, um, I, you know, in terms of positioning, you really got to just know who your customer is and what they want. And a lot of times coming from the U.S. and providing training programs, you have a, an up, right? It's just making sure your brand is strong enough and people are your, you know, your reviews and whatever you're providing, you're getting to their outcome. So I think it doesn't matter if you're international or otherwise. Um, I'm really uh, excited about, I mean, it's the same, it's the same strategy. It really is. Um, but relationships do matter. I think from cultural boundary perspective, you want to make sure you're respecting the cultures and the boundaries and understand who they are as a demographic. So, uh, Rach, I think we're at time. Yes. Thank you so much, Seema, for being here and sharing your insights and knowledge to help founders go through their next stage of their startups. And thank you for all the attendees for asking questions throughout and getting involved on the chat. We appreciate so much that you're being here. Again, we're in day four of DC Startup Week. I don't know where the time has gone this week. I can't believe we're in day four already. We have a packed day ahead of us. We're kicking off 11 a.m. A Founders Focus with Scott Case. He is one of the founding two CTOs of Priceline and now the CEO and founder of Upside also being joined of an Ask Me Anything session. You could ask any of your burning questions. He's really focused on helping founders not only survive, but thrive during this time. We have a couple lunch and learns about getting unstuck as well as pivoting, a full day pack, closing the day with a virtual happy hour. So I hope to see you guys soon. Again, thank you so much, Seema. Thank you for everyone for attending. And hopefully I'll see you guys on the 11 a.m. All right, bye-bye. Take care, guys.